So he moved down to California and found some property in Pasadena that looked like it would work and moved his operation to this area. So that was the origin of Ambassador College in about 1947 with four students and then over the years it began to grow. As we built congregations across the United States we played connect the dots so that we had many churches dotting the nation. Well very early on it was clear that uh, Herbert Armstrong was the work. So what was the role of the member? He said, I'm the one who takes the gospel to the world. I'm the one that God has given the message to. You're a support for me. You can pray for me, and you can donate your money. It was the teaching of our church that a tithe of your income is required of God. And with that kind of financial backing, uh, the ministry grew. This media message was blanketing the United States. It was also spreading across the rest of the world. This spread to Australia, Britain, Germany, France, Netherlands, Italy, the Middle East, Malaysia, uh, the Philippines. And this gospel is going to go around the world. And when it has circled this earth and gone around the world, then, and not until then, and not after then, shall the end of this age come. It went from radio to worldwide Church of God. British Israelism was a very important part of the Worldwide Church of God. It was our identity. That was our identity, being distinct from others. And we viewed that primarily in terms of Sabbath and Holy Days, these laws that made us different from mainstream Christianity. Mr. Armstrong taught that the true Sabbath was Saturday. And of course, Saturday is the seventh day of the week, and God gave that to Israel as a sign. But he said that unless we keep the Sabbath, we're not really Christians, thus condemning the rest of Christianity who don't keep Saturday uh, as unbelievers. Uh, added to that was the seven holy days that you find in the book of Leviticus. Add to that a condemnation of the Trinity. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. I used to sing that song before I knew better. I don't sing it anymore because it's as fake and false as it can be. We believe that God was the Father and that Jesus Christ was the Son, but that the Holy Spirit was a power by analogy like unto electricity. Our identity as the one and only true church was intriguing. It was a real hook to get people. The World Tomorrow. From the World Tomorrow first became a television program in 1955. Well, greetings, friends. Then he began to turn things over, of course, to his son, Garner Ted, who was younger, uh, very handsome. The influence of Garner Ted Armstrong in the early growth of Worldwide Church of God can't be minimized. He was the voice of the world tomorrow beginning in the 60s. It was his voice that people heard. Well, greetings, friends. This is Garner Ted Armstrong bringing you the good news of the world tomorrow. They were quite a dynamic duo, quite, quite a media team that could reach a variety of audiences all across the nation. And as a result, their work grew and grew and grew. Garner Ted Armstrong was more visible for many years, uh, but Mr. Armstrong, his dad, was always the ultimate authority. It was based on a, on a theological holding that he was the only true apostle of Jesus Christ in this age. You had God the Father, Jesus Christ, Herbert Armstrong. And usually those who pressed him on control issues, authority issues, governance issues, found themselves out of a job and excommunicated from the church. Over the years, the relationship between Herbert Armstrong and his son, Garter Ted, uh, appeared to become strained. It was a huge blow to the church to learn that Garner Ted Armstrong had some moral failings back in the uh, early 70s. It finally came to a head, and I really think that the head was not only over the inappropriate behavior, but also to a power challenge, a threat to the position of the father for control of the organization. And it finally came to a point where uh, Herbert Armstrong excommunicated his son 
and that's how those things were dealt with. So people learned, don't challenge Herbert Armstrong. After Gone Ted Armstrong was excommunicated, uh, there was a hole left in the media ministry of the church, but Herbert Armstrong stepped right back into it, and he was really good at it too, and the church continued to grow. Although the membership of the church was just over 150,000, the influence of the church and its mission and ministry was far more extensive. The Plain Truth magazine became quite popular to war. Eight million copies worldwide, one of the largest circulated magazines in the world. The Worldwide Church of God is uh, genuinely a globe-spanning church. The number of countries is well over 50 or 60. That was merely a, a, a factor of, of media penetration and response. By the time he was on television in his later years, he was in his late 80s, early 90s. There'll be change from human to divine. There'll be change from man to God. Mr. Armstrong taught that members of the church would eventually become gods. Someday when you are made immortal, and you become God yourself. Because that made all, all feel good. You know, that yeah, feels great. We'll be God. The road to Godhood was filled with strange things like no birthdays, no Christmas, ladies couldn't wear makeup, uh, and you, if you went to the doctor, that was a lack of faith. We had a theology of not trusting doctors and instead just totally relying upon prayer for healing. Jesus had a perfect body. He was never sick a day in his life. He never had an ache or a pain. God is your own divine healer, not any man. Now, a lot could be said about that because as Herbert Armstrong got older, he used doctors a lot. Still, he continued to teach that it was wrong. That didn't help the people who needed doctors. When I was about five, my mom died. Uh, we thought it was cancer at the time, but the church taught that we should not go to doctors, so she refused to go to a doctor. In his 90s, Mr. Armstrong was too ill to continue without medical help, and that played a part in him finally having to choose a successor. Now, the problem for Herbert Armstrong was, who can I trust? His problem for decades had been he trusted no one. Well, of all things, there was a man who had risen from what was considered a very low position in the ministry, but had shown very much a great deal of zeal and loyalty for Herbert Armstrong for no reason, for no power. Therefore, he was the one that could be trusted to have the power. So Herbert Armstrong, among a variety of people, all who were vying for the position to be a successor, chose Joseph Dukach Sr. The fact that Herbert Armstrong had decided to choose a successor contradicted the teaching, which I, as a pastor, had preached about, that he was the Elijah to come or wouldn't die until Jesus Christ returned. I am a voice crying out in the wilderness, and I'm here to bring you the truth, because you don't hear this from any other voice. No one else is telling you the things that God is telling you through me. He's speaking through me. He has sent me here to talk to you, to give you his word. There was one leading minister who uh, was a high-ranking uh, man who was asked to travel throughout the nation giving messages to all the churches, uh, literally said that Herbert Armstrong is prophesied of in the Bible. He is God's anointed. He is the Elijah to come. He is the Malachi and he cannot die before Christ comes. And here's the statement he literally said, if Herbert Armstrong dies before the return of Christ, then the Bible is not true. I really thought that he was going to live until Christ returned. And this is the room Mr. Armstrong died in. He died right here in a chair, at this spot, right here sitting in a chair. And his bed was right there. And. Uh, that was January 16th, 1986. I remember the, the day he died. I expected something significant to happen because he had set himself up as a person of significance, as the crucial end-time apostle for the leader of the church. 